Hey photographers, how do you take your best photo? In this video, I'm going to walk you through all of the details of configuring your camera settings for optimal results. Now, I'm going to demonstrate with the Fujifilm GFX 50S2, as some viewers asked specifically about this model. Now, much of the guidance in this video applies to all cameras and to most photo situations. Let's start by selecting our size and quality settings. I'm selecting the largest resolution, which on this camera turns out to have an aspect ratio of 4 by 3. While 3 by 2 is more popular, that is the standard aspect of 35 millimeter still film, it's easy enough to crop if that's needed. B.T. Hathaway asked specifically about aspect ratios. I'll provide a little more guidance later. Use the table of contents in the description or YouTube's navigation menu to watch that part. My advice. If you do choose an aspect other than the native 4x3 is to include RAW in your image quality selection. In general, RAW files include the entire output of the sensor and, of course, choose the highest quality JPEG. That's super fine on the 50S2. For RAW, use the highest bit depth if your camera offers that selection and the uncompressed or lossless compressed option. And now in order to make good decisions about the ISO, you'll need to understand your tolerance to the compression artifacts introduced by JPEG processing and the noise created when a pixel doesn't get quite enough light. I usually do this on a tripod, making the images easier to compare and under low light conditions. I inspect the images looking for noise in shadow areas, uh, that applies to both JPEG and RAW files, and for a decrease in definition and clarity in brighter ones, which is primarily a JPEG issue. Once you've determined your camera's capabilities and balanced that with your tolerance, set that ISO as the highest value in the auto ISO control. And then, uh, let's determine how steady your hand is compared to your camera and or your lens's stabilizing capability. If your camera or lens has stabilization, turn it on, although it might also be interesting to learn what it would be without. I find that white text on a dark background or the reverse is the best test. Now, as it's different at different focal lengths, I'm using the longest, 64 millimeters with this 32 to 64 millimeter lens. Now, I start with a shutter duration about 1 over 125 and go down to longer exposure durations. When inspecting these images, concentrate on the area where the focus spot was. When the detail loses its sharpness and starts to be a little fuzzy, for me, that's at one half second, dial back one step. And that's as low as you should let the shutter duration go without using a tripod. <laughs> I'm using one stop increments. You might like to finesse this using one third stop. And now we decide which exposure mode to use. Program, aperture or shutter priority, and manual. Now, I'm going to suggest that if your camera has an effective auto ISO, as the 50S2 does, that you use manual. <laughs> because with auto ISO, not really manual. This enables you to set the aperture to achieve the depth of field you prefer and set the shutter to the duration you prefer without worrying about the impact either has on the overall exposure. Two notes for novices. Shorter shutter durations will freeze the action of things that are moving quickly. Longer durations capture some motion blur. Now, if you only want to control the shutter, use shutter priority, the camera will set the appropriate aperture. And then, larger apertures provide a shallow depth of field to blur the background for portraits. A smaller aperture creates a deeper focus area for landscapes. Aperture priority lets the camera set the shutter duration. Although the electronic displays on mirrorless cameras provide a what you see is probably what you get preview, the histogram display will demonstrate if the image is properly exposed. Now, it should be centered. If the display is to the left, the image will be dark. To the right, it will be bright. 
pushing too far in either direction will result in underexposed and undefined shadow areas, we call that crushed, or overexposed and undefined bright areas, which we call blown. But that may be your creative intent. You're the photographer. The histogram is your assistant, not your boss. Well, wait a minute. How can you adjust the exposure? If you change the aperture or shutter duration, auto ISO will just compensate to correct. So many will adjust the exposure compensation. But I don't, and don't recommend that. Your camera has three settings that change the exposure, shutter, aperture, and ISO. When you change the exposure compensation, it adjusts one of those three. It is not a fourth adjustment. When exposure changes are required, first I set the ISO manually, as long as it's within the range I determined was acceptable. And if that's not enough, I change the shutter duration or aperture to a less than ideal setting, depending on which is more important to my creative intent. But there is a fourth element that can be adjusted, and that's light you may move your subject to a setting where there is more or better light, or you can use a flash. If you don't like the look of flash images, you likely need to improve your flash technique or your flash equipment. That's a topic for another day. Now, finally, let's look at the two ways to adjust the color reproduction of your image, starting with white balance. In most cases, Auto White Balance does a very good job, and the 50S2 has three Auto White Balance modes, as most recent models do. Ambience Priority will retain some of the quality of low-light interiors, which tend to amber from the tone of incandescent lights. White Priority will skew slightly in the other direction. Uh, for a series of photographs, for example, a series of various family combinations at a wedding, consistency is more important than accuracy. The slight variation that may occur between two auto ISO readings can change colors and skin tones for distracting effects. So for scenarios like that, it's best to set a white balance using one of the presets or by capturing a custom white balance. Now, in addition, taking a reference image that includes a color chart like the DSC Labs Chroma Selfie will help while you're editing but you will need to take a reference image for each change in lighting. Uh, don't overlook the ability to make small hue adjustments using the white balance shift feature. Now, the second color management system starts with color profiles. Fujifilm calls them film simulations. All of the other decisions you've made so far combine technical settings with your creative intent. Film simulations are all about your vision for the image you're creating. Although the effects range from subtle to dramatic, you must decide which serves your purpose best. This quick review through them barely does them justice. They're best explored at leisure, and clearly there might be a right or preferred one for a specific situation, so analyzing them over the same image is kind of pointless. The 50S2 has a setting to capture an image with a single film sim, or using the bracket feature, you can select three different film sims, saving three JPEG images from each exposure. If you also save the RAW file, you can create additional versions to try others, or all of them, in playback. Fujifilm also provides an additional set of controls. Some, like dynamic range, D-range priority and tone curve change the balance of the exposure. The dynamic range settings require higher ISOs. For 200%, the ISO must be 200 or higher. For 400%, ISO 400 or higher. If you're using auto ISO, it will force those settings. Here's what you get when using dynamic range adjustments. 200 and 400%. Uh, D-range priority is similar, but I find it to be more effective. The settings here are weak and strong, along with off and auto. When activated, it turns off the dynamic range setting. It has similar ISO restrictions. It's also best used with auto ISO. 
Changing the tone curve does not limit your ISO. Shadows and highlights can be adjusted. Lowering both creates a less contrasty image. Increasing the controls increases the contrast, but the overall dynamic range of the image remains the same. Now, in addition to the tint adjustments made with the white balance shift, there's a saturation control and the color chrome settings that modify color reproduction. The saturation control increases or lowers the amount of color. The effects of the chrome settings can be subtle and can be more or less pronounced depending on the scene. Finally, grain, smooth skin, and sharpness manage detail in your images. Experimentation is key to understanding the impact of these settings. Combinations of these settings are nearly infinite, and many Fujifilm photographers create combinations, which they call recipes, providing advanced effects, creating film simulations on steroids. Again, if you've saved a RAW file, these are settings that can all be added or changed during playback, which means that you can do a lot of experimentation at your desk after you've taken the image to see the ones that might be most useful for your images. So, in camera, these adjustments can be saved as custom settings. Unfortunately, there's not yet an adjustment for custom RAW conversion profiles. Although I realize there are websites with recipes, I really encourage you to work with these on your own, with your own images. That gives you a better understanding of these controls and their effects. I'm going to conclude with some thoughts to address BT's questions about aspect ratios. Now, in camera, the 50S offers seven variations on aspect ratio. The default, the one that takes full advantage of the sensor and provides the highest resolution image is 4x3, 51 megapixels. For the rest, as I scroll down the list of options, either the horizontal or vertical resolution is reduced and the megapixel count reduces accordingly. So technically, your best option may be to stick by 4x3 and if a crop or a different aspect ratio is needed, you can do that in editing. Why all these options? What do they represent? 4x3 is a classic and common digital display ratio, although computer monitors and TVs are now tending to 16x9. Many devices, like iPads, continue to use this format. 4x3 is also the base aspect ratio of the 4 thirds format. 3x2 is the classic small format film aspect. 35mm is 3x2, APS-C also 3x2. In this case, classic goes back to the 1930s when Kodak introduced the 35mm format. The true classic film format is 1 to 1, or square. Uh, Kodak 120 roll film was square, as were the original Polaroids. Square continues to be popular on social media sites like Instagram. But that really speaks more to the physical and technical constraints, not to your artistic sensibility. How do we, how do you see the world? What is the ideal format to represent an image? Well, unlike photographers, painters, in general anyway, don't have a technical rationale for choosing one aspect over another. Leonardo's Mona Lisa, to cite a famous example, is 77 centimeters tall, 53 centimeters wide, about three by two. Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring is 44 centimeters by 39 centimeters, nearly square. Pete Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie is 127 centimeters square. Rembrandt's Night Watch is 3.6 meters by 4.4 meters, pretty close to 4 by 3. Jacques-Louis David's The Coronation of Napoleon, 6.2 meters by 9.8 meters, about 3 by 2. Van Gogh's Starry Night is 74 centimeters by 92 centimeters, close to 4 by 3. And I realize I'm picking and choosing, but both 3 by 2 and 4 by 3 are fairly popular aspects for painters. And no discussion of aspect ratio is complete without referencing the golden ratio, 
a mathematical abstraction which has many other names including the divine proportion. Acceptance of its ratio of 1 to 1.6 or 3.2 by 2 as the most aesthetically pleasing proportion dates back over 2,000 years and continues to be observed, both explicitly and implicitly. Well, that's a very shallow introduction. Hours of good reading await you on this topic. BT, I hope this helps. Now, you can improve your skills by making lots of images. Keep going until you drain your battery and fill up your card. Practice before you get to the final soccer game or your holiday in Fiji. This channel is not sponsored. I don't stop in the middle to promote something unrelated. You're free to watch my videos uninterrupted by mid-roll ads. I do appreciate those who've decided to subscribe, and it's not too late for you to join us. I'm very grateful to those who support this channel by being members. The join button below lets you become a sponsor. But subscribers need not worry. No content will be behind a paywall. Please choose the option that suits your needs. And thanks for watching. Stay safe. Thank you.